you without too many details, but with hopefully many of the ideas of how uh, so many of the things we talked about come together to give a proof of the most degenerate case of the trisecant conjecture. So uh, please remember the discussion that we had about integrable systems in the last hour. Let me now bring the trisecants into the picture. So remember uh, that trisecants were uh, uh, something like that, that the Kuma image of some one point, you know, P plus Q minus R minus S, uh, wedge some other Kuma image, wedge some other Kuma image, were zero, right? And this corresponds to an actual trisecant, meaning here is your Kuma image and you actually have a trisecant. And we were able to degenerate this uh, and compute what happens, so the most degenerate case will be the case of a flex line. So this is a flex line. And I wanted to uh, do this case. So flex line we discussed was when the Kuma image of some point, so the point was denoted by Q. And then there was some uh, vector U, so that you were supposed to take the derivative of the Kuma image in Q. And then there was another vector V, so that you were supposed to take such a combination of derivatives of the Kuma vector at Q, and they were supposed to be collinear. They were supposed, these three things were supposed to lie on the line. So instead of writing wedge, let me actually write out what it means that they are collinear. It means that some linear combination of them is zero. So there are some coefficients here, and I'll write some formulas for the coefficients, which will not be the kind of formula you expect, but let me say, you know that so that you can at least find it in some paper. So this is usually called p minus e squared, and this is called 2p, and this is 0. Uh, so p here, unfortunately, is not a point of the curve. It's a number, and e here is a number, All right? So I mean, I, I'm free to, to call this coefficients whatever I like. And of course, you know, if I call this 2p, then uh, I know what e is from here. So this is just an, a convenient notation. So this is what a flex line is, right? So notice that this is a, a condition for the Kuma image of a certain point Q, right? So uh, uh, by now I want to remind you that there is a bilinear relation which tells you the following essentially, that if you were to take the theta of x plus y times the theta of x minus y, that this is equal to the Kuma image of x dot the Kuma image of q. So this is scalar product, scalar, sort of C scalar product in C to the 2G. Right? It's not the Hermitian product. This was the bilinear relation. I'm just writing it sort of in this way. So now I would like to use it. to rewrite uh, the flex as a condition on theta function of z for all z. So uh, I won't actually do this computation. Let me explain what happens for the trisecant, and then I'll uh, say that something like that could be done here. So for example, for a trisecant, which is to say that the Kuma image of some point z1 times some coefficient a1 plus a2 times the, times the Kuma image of z2 is equal to the Kuma image of z3, or maybe plus is equal to 0, right? So if you do this, so now you can take a dot product of this with the Kuma image of an arbitrary point z, right? And if you were to take a, the scalar product, I mean, this is an identity of vectors in C to the 2G, so you could take a scalar product. So in here you'll get, you know, A1 theta of Z plus Z1 over 2 theta of, just Z plus Z1, sorry, theta Z minus Z1 plus A2 theta of Z plus Z2, theta of Z minus Z2 plus theta of Z plus Z3 theta of z minus z3 is zero, 
right? Uh, and this is supposed to happen for all z, and you can easily check that this is in fact equivalent to this. Because if you now go back, you'll get that this times kuma of z is zero, but the kuma, but the kuma map, I mean, this is the coordinates are the basis for sections of two theta, so if it's zero, then all the coefficients are zero. Okay. So by the way, if we're trying to prove a characterization by tri sequence, this would be the starting point, and this is a difference equation for the theta function. But I, I don't want to go this. So uh, similarly, but uh, when I write similarly and don't do the computation, I mean, it means you need to compute. So sort of one page. Uh, you can do the same here. So it's going to be a bit harder because you're differentiating. And you have to be very careful because when you take here and you take the derivative with respect to x, say, there will be two terms on the left, one term on the right. You have to be careful. So what I claim is that uh, this condition is in fact equivalent to the following statement that the following identity holds that, uh, and I'll call this star, because this will be our starting point, that if you take d squared x minus dy plus u, and u is a function of xy times psi, x, y, z is 0. Okay? Where, now I'll write down what u and psi are. And I, I do realize that when I write it out, it somehow comes a, as a bit ad hoc, but if you actually were to try to rewrite this using the bilinear identity, you will get something of this kind. This is written differently, as you'll see in a moment. So where u is minus 2, dx squared log theta of ux plus vy plus z. And psi is the kind of thing we had before, a theta of q plus ux plus vy plus z. Uh, this was a capital Z, as this is. Theta of ux plus vy plus z, e to the px plus e y. Okay? So let's see what happens. So a u has a denominator, which is a theta squared, right? Uh, this guy has a denominator. If you try to unravel all of this, you'll get a certain expression, which will certainly have the exponential in it. It will also have the square of this theta in the denominator. You might wonder whether this will also have the cube of the theta in the denominator, because when you multiply u and psi, you'll get the cube term also. But the cube term will luckily cancel with one of the derivatives, so it will not be there. So this whole thing, I mean, it will be a certain expression uh, divided by theta squared of ux plus vi plus z times the exponential of the same thing, right? And if this is 0, I mean, you just cover up these two parts and you get a 0. And the thing up there will somehow be bilinear. Each term will involve one derivative of theta and another derivative of theta. And this will all be equivalent to this. This is a claim I'm not going to substantiate because it's a result of a computation. Why it turns out to be this particular equ equation, which we have seen. We just saw it a second ago, right? Because this is the same as to say that the L1 we had in a, a moment ago minus d dy applied to psi was 0, right? Because L1 was the sum of these two things, right? Okay. So this is, a, this is not accidental. Because you remember, so uh, when we were getting the KP equation, so KP equation uh, is the first non-trivial term, non-trivial daily term, in expanding uh, this thing. So I'll have to number my equations. So let's call it 1 near q equal to 0. Okay. So that's one way you can look at it. The other way you can look at it is, well, what does it mean that you have a 1 jet? It certainly means you have a 0 jet. Just th this is true. And the next is true. So the kp 
in fact, is equivalent to the system of two equations, one being this one, and the second one being that if you take the third derivative plus 3 halves u dx plus some w minus, and there, you're supposed to have a t, psi is equal to 0. Well, now everything becomes a function of x, y, and t. Okay? So this was our L2 a second ago. And we claim that the psi is going to be an eigenfunction of a, a kernel of L1 minus d dy and also of L2 minus d dt. So what I'm claiming is that the KP equation, and the way we discussed it, you know, I got these two, right? So I got these two, and then I said that, uh, so the KP is, it was equivalent to the fact that L1 minus dy commutator with L2 minus dt was zero, right? And this commutator being zero is equivalent to these two functions, to these two equations having a common solution psi, right? So the KP equation has more data in it than just this equation. That's not very surprising because KP says you don't just have one flex line, you have a one, one jet of a family of flex lines. So. Does this make sense? I'd be very happy if somebody asked the question now. No? So, okay, so let me just repeat it anyway. So, because I want to. Okay, so this is a condition to have one flex line, right? At a point Q, that's a, a tangent line to the Kuma image. So there is a tangent line to the Kuma image at the point Q, which is tangent to multiplicity 3. If you perturb the point Q, you'll get, you know, more conditions. If you write uh, this expansion near zero, you'll get the KP equation. On the other hand, we know that the, what is the KP equation? Well, the KP equation is a condition that uh, such two differential operators commute, where L1 is, uh, you know, dx squared plus u, and L2 was this thing. That we discovered last time. And then you uh, solve for w, and you get an equation for u, which is some kind of complicated equation. So the KP is a system of these two equations for one psi, right? On the other hand, I'm claiming that if you use the bilinear relation, one flex line is just equivalent to the first equation. Okay? So somehow the first equation, this one, this one, means you have one flex line, and the second piece means you also have a one jet of a family. Okay? Together. So uh, the theorem that uh, Schiotta proved in 86 was that if the theta function of an abelian variety satisfies Kp, then your abelian variety is a Jacobian. So this means if both of these are satisfied. And the theorem that Kritschewer proved in 2006 was that if star is satisfied, with, you know, u and psi given by this formula. So star is sort of not just the condition that you have this equation, but you have u given like that and psi given like that. So it's an equation for theta. Then you have a Jacobian. So this, of course, is a strictly stronger result because here you need two equations and here you only need one, okay? So the goal for what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes is to try to explain some of the ideas of the proof here. And this will be a whirlwind tour, so I won't do it the details, and I'll just give you the steps of the proof. Okay? Any questions on where we're going? Okay. In, in a sense, yes. I mean, this implies that. I, Mm? No, 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 th this is not used. This is never used. So somehow the idea of the proof is similar, no question. But technically you don't use this result. So here you somehow construct the KP hierarchy. So 
Here you don't have the hierarchy that you know you need to construct, so you build up the hierarchy and you solve something. And there are certain difficulties that I'll try to explain a bit more. Uh, this case, the fully non-degenerate trisecant, was also solved. Uh, but this requires some more work. So you see this, uh, there is no differentiation here. It's a difference equation if you view it properly. And we have not discussed difference operators, and I don't think I have a chance to do so now. The ideas in some basic way are similar. The technicalities are much harder. Okay, so let me just leave it at that. I'll be happy to discuss the technicalities later on. Okay. So, so I want to prove. This. I want to explain how you would prove this theorem. So, how do you prove a theorem like that? Well, you assume star. So, let me write star. So, d x squared minus d y plus u times psi is equal to zero. So this is our equation star, where u is equal to uh, minus two d x squared log of theta and psi is equal to whatever it is usually equal to, okay? So this is my condition star, I'll just keep it here. Okay, so what actually was proven was a bit more than this. So here, you know, I said that if you, this is satisfied with this u and this psi, then uh, the abelian variety is a Jacobian. But uh, in, in fact, a, a weaker statement suffices. But let me before explain the idea. So idea. Uh, so this psi, you notice, depends. There is some dependence on the point z of the abelian variety, right? So idea. Construct a formal solution. Psi x y k of star. Okay. So here there is no z. Okay. So we just construct locally near points. There is no parameter z. So I mean this is uh, this are the steps essentially. Uh, uh, so you notice that this psi. Uh, is going to need to be, is not unique. We need to normalize it somehow. Again, this is all local. Okay. So then construct a pair, construct another differential operator. Commuting, uh, sorry, uh, differential operator for which psi is an eigenfunction. So let's call this operator L. Okay. So then it implies that L commutes with dx squared minus dy plus u because they have a common eigenfunction psi. Okay. Edit the differential operator in one variable. You'll see. Yeah, no, not really. The commutator will be a differential operator in one variable. So the dependence on x, y, and z is, I mean, you have to be very careful with what you say here. It will be tricky. Okay. So then uh, you'll argue that L does not depend on normally on the on the local normalization of psi and thus I can be defined globally on the abelian variety. So then we have, so thus have L and this globally defined on the abelian variety. So 
so we get a spectral curve. So a spectral curve is a curve corresponding to the algebraic equation which they satisfy. Okay. So eventually we'll then argue that the Baker Heather function on gamma must coincide with size that we constructed. And that and this would imply that our abelian variety would be the Jacobian of gamma. Okay. So that's the approach. Now let me list some difficulties. Difficulties. So if we construct, so psi can be constructed to be smooth away from the theta divisor. Because you see on the theta divisor, the u we have here is going to blow up. Right? So psi is going to have poles on theta divisor, or rather some translate of the theta divisor, but no, let's not worry about it. Okay? So normalization uh, you can do, so that's one problem. The normalization, uh, you can uniquely choose a normalization invariant on the translation by by the vector u. So unfortunately, there is a small u, which is a function, and there is a capital U, a vector. So this is a capital one. OK? So if u, so that if the closure of u times c is a, then we're in good shape. Because then uh, psi is sort of globally well normalized. If not, we have trouble. Because then on each, so you imagine you have an abelian variety, and here is your vector u. And it turns out the vector u generates, say, an elliptic curve inside your abelian variety. Then on each slice in the direction u, you have some way to normalize. But then you don't have a global way to normalize. That's why you have that. Uh, then uh, the spectral curve. Gamma may be a priori singular and of arbitrary genus. Okay. So this is the problems with which one has to deal if you're going to try to solve this, to prove this. Okay. So let me now try to explain how this actually happens in a more sequential manner. So again, the idea is we look at this uh, statement in the beginning, and our first goal will be to construct a formal solution psi, which will somehow be local in the abelian variety. So let me try to be a bit more precise and try to explain what happens. Okay. So the first thing to do is actually uh, to weaken the assumption. So the assumption was this, that this is satisfied with u and psi such that blah. Let's for a second uh, forget about the theta function. So step one. Assume for a second that star is satisfied for u being equal, well, we'll still have minus 2d squared x, logarithm 
of some tau function x, y. For some tau. Okay. So what I would like to see is I see what this implies. for the zero locus of tau. So what I mean by this is the following. So let xi, so a function of y, be uh, zero of tau xy. So I'm implicitly solving the implicit function theorem. So I'm saying so let's locally near the locus where tau of x, y is 0. Let's express uh, x, i as a function of y. OK? So claim for, uh, yes, and of course when I assume that, so for psi I also write something involving tau. Uh, so I'll write tau something. And then I'll write something over tau for, for the psi. So well, the formula for psi, remember, and this was ux plus vy plus z. And here the denominator was the same. So now for psi, I'll assume that there is an arbitrary numerator, but the same denominator. So, they say, so psi will have the form 1 over tau. So for, psi, for star to be satisfied, implies the following. So if you take xi and you take the second derivative with respect to y, uh, this is equal to the, the coefficient of x minus xi in the expansion. So u, you see, it's uh, minus 2 dx squared of the logarithm. So if I were to expand it, you know, there'll be a term of x minus xi quantity squared. If I'm trying to expand it in powers of x near expansion of u near x equal to xi. Right? So there'll be something here plus something here, and then there'll be a, a coefficient, coefficient of x minus xi. And the claim is that for a star to be satisfied, this needs to be true. The dy squared needs to be equal to this coefficient and this expansion. Uh, proof, expand and compute. Okay. So you expand everything in Taylor series and write this. Uh, why uh, do, would people think of doing anything of this kind? Well, it's actually the following. That this equation that I wrote here, which lo may look funny to you, is some kind of nice equation. So this, this is an infinite dimensional Kalajara Moser system of a certain kind. So this is an equation that people have seen for particles behaving in a certain way. OK. So I mean, the proof is expand and compute. Uh, and this is I mean, a straightforward computation. So now. Step two, now plug in, plug theta in, and write this out. Moreover, evaluate along the theta divisor. So, this condition that the second derivative of xi is equal to this thing, when theta of z is equal to 0, theta of, sorry, ux plus dy plus z is equal to 0, right? Because this is where we're working. We're working near the locus where the tau is 0. So that's where we work. Becomes a certain thing. A sixth order differential equation, nonlinear, for, for theta function. 
uh, you can copy it from the paper, but I mean it sort of starts like this. So this means you get some equation two on the theta divisor. So the theorem actually proven is the following. If two holes on the theta divisor abelian variety is a G-copy. Notice that this implication certainly holds because we were able to derive this by starting from having a flex. The opposite implication is not at all clear. Because suppose you have this. Why would you know that you can construct a solution over there? So at the end of the day, you do so, but the only way that seems to be known how to do so, you first prove the theorem, then you have a Jacobian, then, of course, this is satisfied, but there is no direct way. So this is a, a significant weakening. And it's somehow interesting that this is only a condition on the theta divisor, and it's uh, really messy. I mean, in comparison to that, it, you, it's quite messy. I mean, there are more terms that I just didn't write out because it doesn't help. Uh, so how do you check this? I mean, this, again, you just compute out, right? So you take the exp expression, plug in the theta function, plug in your psi, Evaluate, and whenever you see theta, it's zero. So you get something. Okay. Next step. So our goal now is to prove this. So all we have is this thing called two. So uh, let's get back to this. So I mean, we, you don't even care about this. So in this setup, back with tau, is uh, construct recursively a solution psi of star. such that as a function of x, it has simple poles and this xi only. Uh, construct recursively a formal solution, of course. So a formal solution means it's going to be psi Let me be careful. Okay, so for a fixed, so this thing is a fixed. This is a fixed point in the abelian variety. Then I can construct a formal solution with respect to k around this point, which will depend in a significant way on x and y. And I claim that it can be constructed such that it has simple poles only at xi. So xi were the points where the theta function is 0, considered as a function of x only. Okay. How do you do this? Uh, proof. Expand. So we're going to write psi is going to be equal to some exponent times the sum of xi s of xy c k minus s s goes from 0 to infinity and you're just going to solve recursively and solve Recurrently. 
When you are doing this, this takes a couple of pages. So uh, a miracle happens. That the condition two at every step guarantees that you only have guarantees the cancellation of high order poles. So you see, when you are solving, you know, you solve for the coefficient xi1, then you solve for xi2, and you can uh, imagine that you will be divided by this tau more and more as you go on. But it turns out that somehow, the moment you know this, or more precisely, the moment you know that the the, you know this, the higher order pole will cancel. And it happens to be that the same condition controls this at every term in the Taylor expansion. And that's no, a result of a computation. There is no motivation I know of here, though of course it's very tempting to say, tempting to explain by saying something of the following kind, that if you wanted to try to solve something in uh, n plus first jet bundle, this you can map to jet n to zero, and and then you can do this, and then you can argue, and then you can try to argue that the only obstruction you could possibly have uh, could be in yeah, the first jet bundle. Okay, but this is tempting to th say something like that. I cannot say this formally, and I don't want to explain what any of these words mean. Uh, this has not been done, but uh, I mean somehow the result is that if you don't have the abstraction the first time, if you can solve it for the first term size one, then you can solve it step by step always, and this would be somehow something like that would be a meaningful explanation. I don't know how to say it precisely, and it's not just me. Okay. So uh, as a result, we will have you know, xi s of x, y. So it's going to be a certain function, tau s, say, of x, y. Uh, and it's supposed to have a simple pole where tau is 0. So I use tau to denote the, this theta function. For, li for much of the argument, it's not really used that this is a theta function, just tau of x and y. Okay, and the simple pole just means I only have a simple pole here. Oh, I mean, this, this is uh, just uh, some unknown function that can be constructed. It has no relation to tau whatsoever. So, so far we have a formal solution. So this is a solution for x and y, uh, for the xi s of x and y. It's completely formal. So step four, uh, try to choose a normalization. Remember, the, the way we were doing this with uh, differential operators, you, choose, you have such a solution, but then you can, of course, multiply it by any power series. So this is, I mean, this is, the, the k is always there, right? So you want, the, and the z is al also there. So when you try to do this, uh, you somehow need to, to say something about how you're going to fix it. And notice, this things are in C, but eventually, at the end of the day, we would like to construct a function. We want an actual function on the abelian variety. It's 
So this means that you want somehow to choose a normalization in such a way that it's invariant under the translation by the period vectors. So this actually gives you something meaningful as a normalization on the abelian variety. So what happens is the following. So, so we look at so we look at how xi s changes under z goes to z plus u. Right? Or times something x. And if you look at the, at the differential equation here, the u appears in many places. So away from the locus which plays a crucial role here, so let me denote that sigma, so this is a set of points z in the abelian variety, such that theta of z is zero, and the derivative of theta of z is also zero. Okay. The reason something crucially bad happens here is because if theta is zero, this means your functions are going to have a pole. If the derivative with respect to u of theta is also zero, uh, the analog for the trisecant would be if the theta of z plus u is zero. Uh, what happens is that by moving along u, you cannot get rid of this pole. You cannot extend there by arguing something that if you move along, something happens. So as a result is away from the sigma, you can choose essentially a normalization invariant under u. So let me try to say what this means. So uh, there exists a unique function f uh, phi, I guess, of z, y, and k, so there is no x anymore, which is e to the b, y, uh, the sum of xi s, z, y, k minus s. Such that it has a pole at uh, the theta divisor translated is invariant on the z goes to z plus u and unique up to phi can be replaced by phi times as a multiple, which is not going to depend on y anymore, but it's going to depend on z and k. You, this would remind you of what we were doing when we had one variable x. The multiple would not include x. It would be just renormalization with respect to k. So we have a parameter z, and here we must have the derivative of this row with respect to u is equal to 0. Okay. So this is essentially to say that not only we can construct a solution psi and uh, such that phi, which will be equal to e to the kx plus k squared y phi, say this phi is phi of ux plus vi y plus z y, say this phi is star. So I'm trying to say that here we had a solution which depends on x, y, z, and k. So now I'm trying to kill the dependence on x by saying that the solution will instead be invariant under the shift by u. And that's, uh, that's exactly what I prescribe. I say that there is a solution without u in here, which is invariant if I add u here. And then I just write down the solution psi. 
as this invariant under the shift by u solution times you know the explicit exponential, and I put the u in here explicitly for differentiation. Okay, that's uh, the next step you need to do. So, how do you prove that this is possible? Proof, expand and compute. Here you have to be very careful. I mean, this locus sigma does appear in a crucial way. On that locus, you cannot do anything. Okay. So now we have something which is invariant under the translation by you. So we now so now we have a solution psi of x, y, z, okay, uh, such that uh, it is invariant on the translation by u. And is defined on the abelian variety away from the single uh, from the bad locus sigma. The okay, next step. Five, I guess. Uh, which is uh, the construction of a differential operator. So I'm going to claim that there exists a unique differential operator L. K, oh sorry, L, I mean L of Z, which is going to be dx plus the sum of certain okay, so pseudo differential operator such that L psi is K psi. Uh, sorry, this psi is now taken, you know, this is a psi at u v x plus v y plus z. So, I mean, the, the actual psi. Okay. Uh, proof. Compute the coefficients of this recursively. Uh, step six. Well, L, of course, commutes with the differential operator we started with. So, as a result, we get a ring L of Z, a ring of differential operators. Commuting differential operators. So this means we get the, all the differential operators now that commute with this guy will also commute with that, and they will commute with each other. So we get a ring of commuting differential operators. The moment we have, the reason these two guys commute is because they have common, so this is true because uh, psi is a common eigenfunction. So you really need to go to infinity, but uh, it, uh, the results will still work, work out. So I mean, this is a pseudo differential operator, so it only goes to infinity that way. And if you want to show that this implies that the fact that they have a common eigenfunction psi still implies uh, that they commute, it, it actually works. Okay. And this is not the greatest lie in this story. So 
this is actually true. It requires a little bit more work. I mean, essentially, what happens is that after a while, I mean, there is no, the recursion stabilizes after a while, so it's sort of easy to control. Okay. Okay, and there is an observation when you do all of this, uh, which is crucial, is that uh, the coefficient of the derivative dx to minus 1 in Lz has at most a double pole. This is a local computation that you just do by computation. You just look at this uh, thing, and you see that that happens to be the case. Okay. Uh, step seven. Observe that uh, the ambiguity in the choice of uh, this, of the normalization, uh, does not influence the operator L. So L of Z is globally defined. for any z on the abelian variety away from this bad locus, which, with which we still cannot deal. Okay. And it's a bad locus. It's quite dimension 2. So you are tempted, of course, to use Hartog's theorem to at some, at some point to uh, eliminate it. But I mean, these things all can have essential singularities quite easily. So there is nothing you can do quite so drastic. Uh, however, uh, you see that, you know, the, well, never mind. So I, wa I just wanted to emphasize again that we know something that the, the lowest order coefficient has ordered most two. Okay. So step eight, uh, that L of Z and the operator we have in the beginning, I uh, define a spectral curve of genus at most 2 to the g, where g was the original genus of A. Uh, the reason being the following, because L of z is determined uniquely by the fact that L psi is equal to K psi and the knowledge of uh, the coefficient of minus 1 of Z, right? Because we're solving the recursion. So the moment we know the first coefficient, we can go on, OK? But omega minus 1 of Z is a section on the abelian variety of 2 theta, so the dimension of the space of omega minus 1, so omega 1, I guess it was in my notation, sorry, omega 1 of z is at most 2 to the g. Right? So now we have a fixed curve of genus at most 2 to the g. So let gamma uh, be a, this fixed curve of genus at most 2 to the g be the spectral curve. On gamma, we have the baker hezer function. Psi gamma. On 
the other hand, for any z in the abelian variety without here, where we can construct all of this, we have a map z to the corresponding ring of operators. the corresponding point on gamma. Because uh, recall here, any commutant pair of differential operators, and we have such commutant pair for any z which is different, uh, we can correspond to a curve gamma, which is always the same curve for all z, and the point p naught on it, and more data, right? So that the psi corresponding to this p naught will be okay. So finally, step nine. So we have a map finally, and another point on gamma. Uh, Torsion free rank one sheaf gamma. So we have a map. So if gamma is smooth, for example, we'll get a map from the abelian variety without sigma to gamma to the Jacobian of gamma. And here we have the uh, Baker Hieser function. And we can pull it back. So then this pullback can be extended. And this is Hartog theorem to all of A because, I mean, this is in our function which had one essential singularity which we can control. We know where it were. And this is a quasi-dimension two locus. And thus gives a global solution to, you know, everything. Okay? And then there is one last step that I don't think I can explain much of the idea of how you do it even, is we can verify that in fact the abelian variety is isomorphic to the Jacobian of this curve gamma. Okay? So we already have a map, we need to show it's an isomorphism. And, and what you do, is, so, so that mentally what you would do, you would say that this is the same, there is a function here, there is a function here, the eigenfunctions for the same differential operators, so they should be the same function. And that's roughly what you do for the curve gamma being smooth. That's quite straightforward. The problem is if gamma is singular, which it could well be, it's just, it just comes from some polynomial. And this is really torsion free rank one shift, so we are normalizing something. It's a bit complicated. And at that point, you'll again need to use the condition that there is, you know something here, that there is some a priori bound. And it, you will see that you can bound the dimension of where you actually un end up is by being g, because this will be the, the partial der derivative, so the logarithm of the theta function in all directions, and there are g of them, and they will generate everything. So you know the dimension will be at least, at most g, but then it has to be g. Okay, so this is the proof. Now let me say a couple of words about, I, mean, I realize I haven't really proven it, but this is the steps of the proof. Much of it, as you could see, were computations. And I know when you look at the proof for the first time, you would think, okay, the computations are the easy part, the hard part is all the conceptual stuff. But for the people who have been working in integrable systems for 20 years, this does not include me, uh, it seems that the things that you would view as conceptual are sort of the standard knowledge. So the standard techniques are, are you, you have an equation, you construct a formal solution, you construct a ring of differential operators for which this formal solution is uh, a common eigenfunction. 
Then you construct a curve, then you show that this is a curve you really wanted from the original problem. This is somehow the standard philosophy in the ideology and technique. And this is how Shiota's proof for the original KP equation worked. And this is the idea. So the crucial parts here are really in the computations from this point of view. So the new thing that was not there 20 years ago largely is in the computations and in the idea that you can construct things locally. So uh, globally, so I mean, so discussion, uh, sort of globally, uh, the problem is essentially uh, is some obstructions uh, to constructing functions which lie in H1 of the abelian variety without this locus with some sheaf. Okay. And so th if there were no bad locus, you'd be in good shape because then this is trivial. So uh, the question was always, is this trivial? And uh, previous results were essentially uh, due to Arbarello, Marini, De Quancini, Chiotta, Kichivir, were essentially of the following kind. If the obstruction is zero, this obstruction is zero, then the tri-secant conjecture holds. So one way the abstraction can be zero if this locus is empty, or if this locus is not very invariant on translation by you, or if something like that happens, then you're in good shape. And this was the previous results. So the approach here, so the proof does not imply the vanishing of the obstruction, the vanishing of H1. It just doesn't. I mean, so eventually we, can, we could extend everything, so we had our, our solutions psi everywhere, and we were able to extend them globally, but it doesn't mean that we prove the obstruction group is zero. We only proved that the obstruction to extend in our specific solution was zero. And the way it was proven was in the computations I didn't show. It was just shown that this particular obstruction is zero by just killing this obstruction term by term in the Taylor series. And this was how it was done. I mean, there was never any claim as to the triviality of the entire group. The particular obstruction to extend in happens to be trivial because you can solve it formally in Taylor series and at the end of the day argue that your formal solution is good enough. And that's all that happened. So the last couple of words I wanted to say is that, I mean, this is a story for Jacobians, not all abelian varieties are Jacobians, and you can ask what happens for more general abelian varieties. And uh, the next class to consider are the so-called prim varieties, and we have some results on that. Uh, you can ask what happens for the most general abelian variety, whether you get solutions of some interesting equations, and it's not known. But let me just leave you with one question, which will hopefully, which I think is an interesting question. It's easy to state. Uh, has been around for probably a good 150 years. And the answer is not known. And this somehow tells you that there are, I hope it tells me, and maybe it will tell you, that there are still uh, open questions in the field which mean we don't understand quite as much. So a question. For, a, for an abelian variety, for a pi, principally polarized abelian variety, a theta, what is the maximal multiplicity that the theta divisor can have at a point. Okay. So the question is, what is the maximum of all tau and z of the multiplicity of the theta function tau z over at, at the point z? Okay. So here is an answer. Answer. Uh, and this is due to Collar. Maximal multiplicity is G. Okay? And this has no analytic proof. There is also a theorem, and this is due to Smith and Varley, 
which is that if the multiplicity of the theta divided at some point z is equal to g, it follows that the abelian variety is a product of g elliptic curves. Okay? So then a better question to ask is the following question. For a pr principally polarized abelian variety, A theta, that is not a product of principally polarized abelian varieties. What is the maximal possible multiplicity of the theta device at a point Z? And there is a conjectural answer, which is a G plus 1 over 2 run down. And this is true for Jacobians. It's true for prim varieties. And thus true for G at most 5. Well, there is absolutely no idea, I think, that people have how to approach this. And in a sense, I would argue this is a very basic question about the theta function. It's a very explicit function, and you're just asking how many derivatives of it can vanish. And this is uh, obviously going in a direction different, you would think, from the KP equation, but maybe not so much, because you see the a single locus of the theta device of a Jacobian is very large. It has dimension g minus 3 or g minus 4. So somehow, the goal here would try to say that the maximal multiplicity a theta divisor can have would be for a Jacobian as well. And this is not known. So that's it. I'm still here and happy to answer your questions. Thank you for listening. To G? Uh, I mean, it's not. I mean, there you have to understand what really happens. So, uh, uh, where does the 2 to the G come from? The 2 to the G came from me saying that these things have poles of second order on the theta divisor. That's the first uh, coefficient. So, now that uh, you have a global solution, you know everything is global and nice, so these things are all global, all pleasant, and so on. We can look at them again. And if you look at these first coefficients, we know that they have a pole of at most second order. But in fact, what turns out to be true is that omega 1 has to be some derivative of the log of theta. And this means they're at most g of them. Because, I mean, this thing has a second order, uh, sorry, du du di log theta. And the moment you see that, you see there are only g of them because this is a g-dimensional space. But, and then there is some computation. Possibly this pullback, at some point you need to show that this pullback is anti-zero. That's uh, uh, sort of a reasonably easy. I mean, you'll see that the pullback will have some poles and it will have an essential singularity. That's not really a problem. And you somehow need to show, I mean, you want to show that this pullback agrees with the solutions you constructed up to some normalization. And you can show that. <coughs>